Father, thank you so much for the time we've had already where we can come before your throne with songs and praise, adoration. We can express our praise and worship to you, whether we're demonstrative or whether we're stoic. We, we praise you, for you're the only one who deserves it. We're so grateful for that opportunity and that we can come before a throne and lift up our prayers, not just any throne, but the throne, the ultimate throne. You raise up and you pull down and you establish and you build. And Lord, I'm so grateful that we can trust you as we walk through these days. What a privilege we have. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, to our minds, to our souls, that you would equip us to go out and do a good job for your kingdom that you've employed us in, each one of us. Thank you for it. I'm going to give you praise. Amen. Amen. It's kind of ringing. Maybe that's me, but uh, it's ringing. You can hear inside my head. <laughs> it's amazing. Anyway, um, God, our Father, loves us and wants a relationship with us. And it's hard for me to even get past that sentence, if you really think about it, that God Almighty, the sovereign Lord of all, wants to have a relationship with me. What an amazing thought. It, it really is. And sometimes, like we talked last week, you just wish that he would rip open the skies and reveal himself to everybody. That he would do the supernatural. That he would make everything crystal clear. And, and his glory and his power would overwhelm people. And we get a glimpse of it sometime. I was driving home the other night and there's this cloud with the sun behind it and the rays coming down. It was just majestic. And you're going, wow. You know, and some of the sunsets and sunrises, depending on if you're a morning or evening person, are incredible. And you just want to worship God when you see it. And, and it's perfectly natural for us to want God to reveal himself in a supernatural way. Just a glimpse, Lord. If I could just see you, I'd never complain again. Well, as I proved last week, I think, that's not true. For the Word of God is full of stories and examples of people that saw tremendous examples of God's miraculous power, and yet they quickly rejected the author of those things. And they experienced incredible miracles, and still, it wouldn't change what's in the heart of man. Only Salvation can do that, and Jesus can do that. God stated that he would act on behalf of people, and we started looking at this last week. He said he would act on behalf of those who learn to wait on him, and then we went to this verse where you meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? The end of that verse asks a question. Some translations uh, present it as a statement, but the essence of it is, how can we be saved if we remain in our sins, is really what the, uh, they're trying to translate. And I think there's a problem sometimes, there is in my life, that I simply don't understand the death that is unleashed with my sin. I just don't get it sometimes until I experience the consequences of it. See, all sin leads to death and blindness. All sin leads somewhere. And because it doesn't happen instantly, we get accustomed to it. And we don't do what we ought to be doing. And, and I thought about sin always leads us somewhere. You read throughout the scripture. You know, if you get into lust and pornography and adultery, or the, the Proverbs Solomon is writing to his sons primarily. He says, guys, if you go down this path, it's the house of the dead. It's where the dead reside. You don't want to go there. And those of us who have been around a while, we, we see what happens to, to our brothers, particularly in the ministry. You see guys that go down that path, uh, uh, and it ends up just dead. And you're going, don't go there. The Scripture is very clear on that. Anger at our brother. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother, it's the same thing as killing him. God, help me. I get angry <laughs> at times. Bitterness. You're going to defile many people. Sin will take you somewhere. You become bitter. You know, the old expression is it's like drinking poison, waiting for the other guy to die. It doesn't work that way. It will kill you. 
It will eat you up and destroy you. Unforgiveness. You get to this incredible parable in, or story in Matthew 18 where he talks about this unforgiving servant who has been forgiven all that he was forgiven and he ends up in prison. And you can spiritualize that however you want to, but the end of it is not good for the guy who would not forgive. A lack of love. By this the world will know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. If we don't walk in love one to another... We damage our testimony. We, we're, we're a blight on the body of Christ. Ah, is that really what it says? Yeah, that is what it says. God help me. An unruly tongue starts a major fire, James talks about. Really? You ever been around major fires? I've started a few. I, I've actually started some with fire, with you know, fire too. I've done it with my tongue where I've started fires. I know what James is talking about. It says if you practice sin, you become a slave of sin. Sin leads us somewhere. It always leads us somewhere. It just leads us to death and destruction and slavery. And hate leads to walking in darkness, not being able to see. Do I have hate in my heart? I try not to have hate in my heart. Show me, God, when, when, when it comes out of me. Yeah. I'm amazed at the junk that's still in there. Yeah. After all these years of knowing the Lord, and you see these outbursts of flesh, and you're going, God, just shoot me. <laughs> is there any hope? And of course the answer is yes, there is hope. You continue on in Isaiah, which is where we are, and he says we have all become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. It's also a picture of sin and the results of sin. He, he says we've become unclean. He's really talking about lepers. You want to go see what lepers are like? Go visit Arnie in China. He'll take you to the leper colony, and, and as bad as it is there, and it is bad, it's nothing compared to what it was like when they're writing this. Lepers were a despised people, a skin disease that you had to cover yourself with dirt and with a sackcloth and, and with a hood and yell, unclean, unclean, if anybody got anywhere near you. There was no relationship. There was no physical contact with anybody. You get to Leviticus, and it's page after page after page of how to deal with you know, mildew and mold and leprosy and all this stuff. And I read through it every year, and I'm going, are you kidding me? And yet the principle is there that sin is like that. Even our righteous deeds can become polluted with a little bit of leprosy, a little bit of sin. Think Pharisees. Pharisees started out wanting to be zealous for God. They wanted to keep the law. They wanted to be pure. They wanted to be holy. They wanted to memorize God's word. They wanted to be good, godly people. And yet, their righteous deeds were polluted so many times. You strain a gnat and swallow a camel, Jesus said. You'll go to your garden and you'll count out and make sure that every tenth leave of your mint is tithed. And yet you hate righteousness. And, and they cast a guy who got healed of blind eyes out of their sanctuary, out of their, you can't be here anymore because you acknowledge Jesus. Well, he healed me. I don't care. You can't be here. They decided to kill Jesus. They decided to kill Lazarus. Their righteous deeds were polluted. And they missed it all. They kept the letter of the law and missed the spirit of the law. He says you fade like a leaf, <laughs> blown away easily by the winds of this life. These are graphic word pictures that you and I should be able to relate to. A leaf, when it becomes disconnected from a tree, does what? <laughs> it, it dies. You know, we're supposed to abide in the vine. When we get disconnected from the vine, we turn brown, we fall to the ground, we get blown around, we end up in a burn pile. Ours don't, they just blow around the neighborhood, but, you know, we're not connected to the root anymore, and we lose the life that's there. And he says, your sin is like this. <laughs> he said, there's no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. It's sad. <laughs> Even in the face of captivity, even in the face of destruction as a nation, even in the overwhelming consequences of their sin, Isaiah says there's no one who's taking hold of the Lord. There's no one crying out to God. Where is the Mary that's grabbing onto his feet and saying, I won't let you go, don't leave me? That wasn't going on. Do I ever get like that? What a picture. I won't rouse myself to take hold of him. 
I won't get up. I won't do what needs to be done. Everybody in here knows we should be, you know, crying out to the Lord. We should be praying. We should be reading the scripture. We should be doing this. And yet it's so easy to just let it go, isn't it? And we, and we get cut off. And it's so easy to drift. And he says, you won't rouse yourself. You won't even take hold of him. You want a picture. How about this one? I'm melting in the hand of my iniquity. Ow. You know, I grew up watching that movie with the Wicked Witch of the West melting. You know, I'm melting. You know? and, and it's like, do we do that? I'm melting in this, Lord. And yet I won't rouse myself. I won't call upon you. I won't need... I won't do what needs to be done. I've made sinful choices, and I've not even realized where they're leading me. And maybe that's just me. Maybe you guys don't struggle with this, but what a sad picture it is. And it's a sad picture for Isaiah's readers. And yet I'm so grateful that it doesn't end there because at the depths of my sin, at the depths of my failure, at the worst possible low spot I can get to, God is there. And He's waiting for me to come to Him. Isaiah says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. (laughs) We're all a work of your hand. What a familiar passage. And after admitting sin and death and destruction unleashed by our sins, we can run to our good, good father. We can run there. And he opens his righteous, loving, holy arms and receives us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus walked on the earth, and he did the unthinkable. And I've shared this before, but, it, but it, it, it's, so, it's such a good picture of what Jesus was like. Lepers would go around and say, unclean, unclean, and people would throw rocks at him and get away from him and run from them in terror. One of them cries out to Jesus and says, would you heal me? And he says, I will, and he touched him. Man. Wow. He touched him in his leprosy. He stuck his hand on him. And I would imagine everybody gasped. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You don't touch lepers. I was a leper. Jesus touched me. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that. Jesus healed Pharisees. You know, he loved Pharisees. There's two of them that took care of his body after he died. The outcasts, the downcasts, those that cried out to the Savior were saved, including the guy dying next to him on a cross. (laughs) I'm so grateful for that. The point is, there was no sin that was too hard for our Savior to forgive. And it was true then, and it's true now. Whatever you're liking here today, whatever I'm liking here today, no matter how far I've fallen, no matter how much I've messed up, no matter how often I've done it, if I go to my Father, who is a good, good Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. This is what the Scripture says, isn't it? 1 John 1, 9, doesn't it say that? If we go to Him, He's righteous and just to forgive us of our sin. Isaiah reminds his readers that God is their father. And he makes this change here, and he says, but now. (laughs) When you run into that in the scripture, it's a change of thought, it's an interruption, it's a, you know, you're a mess, and you're like a leaf cut off, and you're melting in your iniquities, but now, you're going, okay, something good's coming. (laughs) Something good is coming, and here's what it is. He's our father. They can change from the sin and the filth and no one calling out to God to, Lord, you're our Father. Would you love me? Would you accept me? Would you take me? Would you change me? Would you mold me? Would you make me? And as our loving Father, He is shaping everything in our life. And we know this illustration. We're the clay. You're the potter. We know it, right? We know the picture. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's quoted in Jeremiah 18, 6. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in the hands of the Lord. And I found this one. I couldn't find it in English. (laughs) Roughly, it translates something like, uh, it hurts, question marks. Don't worry, it is God working in you, or something like that. (laughs) And the guy's smiling, sort of. I mean, it's, I don't know, they wouldn't print it in English. God is the Father. We're the clay. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God the Father is working in us as clay pots, crack pots, half pots, half finished pots, stubborn pots, overcooked pots, undercooked pots, not ready pots, 
A potter sits down at the wheel and he takes a lump of clay, and if he doesn't do anything with it, it just stays as a lump of clay. But this master sits down and he knows the end result. He knows what he's got in mind, as every artist does. Wasn't it Michelangelo who said, every chunk of marble has an end in it. He saw something that no one else could see. God our Father does that. He sees this lump of clay named Jeff or whatever your name is, and he says, I see something there. I'm going, God help me. He sits down at the wheel and he starts doing his thing. (laughs) And he molds. And he does all this stuff. I don't know how to do clay. I've never done it. I, I have no creative ability at all in that area. But I do know that the potter decides the shape. I know he decides the usage of it. And when he's finished, he's got this result in his mind. And he sits down and he starts working on it. And our God, the ultimate potter, does not make junk. Man. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't ruin the pottery. He's got a goal in mind. So when I say something like I'm a masterpiece in process, I mean it and I believe it. I know what I'm like, but I know the potter. I know the problems that are there, but I know the potter. He doesn't make junk. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't fail. And if I am indeed the work of his hand, then what do I need to worry about? What do I need to be in dread about? If God is my father, the creator, the one who holds it all together by the word of his power, the universe, all of that, and he's working in this lump of clay. Is there a place for anxiety in my life? For fear? For worry? For doubt? (laughs) Can God handle my situation? Can God handle your situation? Can he do it? Is he doing it? Will he do it? So even when, and probably better stated, especially when life stinks, When it's hard and it's not working out the way I thought it should work out. See, I have a plan. I I know what's supposed to go on. And then God comes along and messes it all up. (laughs) He just does. Has he ever done that to you? Have you ever had a hard turn in your life? Have you ever had something come to your life? If you're not not very old in here, maybe you haven't yet, but I promise you, you will. (laughs) Is the master still working? Is the master right? Is he good? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that you're unique? You, each one of you, the ones that are staring at me. Do you believe you're unique? I mean, there's 7.6 billion people on the planet right now, give or take. Do you think you're unique? Yes. No. What do you think? Yes. 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 Are you the only you that there is? Some of you are saying, praise God. (laughs) I've always said it, that if two people are exactly the same, one of them isn't needed. Right? right? Well, that's rather harsh. No, it's true. God the Master made you just exactly the way he made you. If there aren't, if there isn't anybody else exactly like you, then did the Creator make you the way you are? Did He make a mistake when He made you? You ever argued with God about that? What were you thinking? I mean, come on! You got to be kidding me! He says, "Do you trust me? Do you love me? Do you believe that I've made you just the way I've made you?" I'm supposed to be six foot four jet black hair and ripped. I'm not. Maybe you noticed. Nah. You can self-identify that way. It's fine with us. God have mercy. Is God's way correct? The, the attack going on, there's always an attack from the enemy, you know that, right? And the attack is going on on gender and, and marriage and all this stuff, but did God make a mistake when he made you male, made you female, made me male, made you female, some of you? Did God make a mistake, or did he know what he was doing? Is the potter a fraud? Is he incapable of doing it correct? Did he mess up when he made you just the way you are? 
I'm not talking about things you can change. I'm talking about the things that are you, only you, you know, birthmarks, those type things, height, deformities, whatever that God gave you. Did God mess up? The fact that you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, did God mess up? Our world says God messed up. Really? What a slap in the face of the potter and the creator. No, he did not. He did not mess up. And the work of God's hand. Matter of fact, we said this in the prayer time, talked about it. Psalms 139, 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Amen. Is that true for you? For each one of you? For me, is that really true? God and I have debated this for 62 years now on lots of issues. Saying, what in the world? What were you doing? Come on. What is this all about? God said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a masterpiece in process. Click, I am working on you. I know you're spinning on the wheel and I'm adding water and I'm shaping this and molding that and smashing that and doing this. I'm working on you. Yeah. Going, okay, God, help me. Help me to trust you that you know what you're doing. And you knew what you did when I was created. So if I am the work of God's hands, and if the potter doesn't make junk and he doesn't make mistakes, then my gender, my race, where I was born, my family placement, my family, my number in the family, all of those things that I had absolutely no control over, they either are random accidents and chances or the potter decided that this is what needed to happen. Which one's true? The master potter, the creator, the one with the plan decided all this or we're just a freak? Am I his workmanship or not? More importantly today is are you his workmanship or not? You, sitting right there, you. Are you his workmanship in Christ Jesus? Created to do good works that only you can do. But I don't know what those are. God does. The master craftsman does. He had the end in mind when he started. He knows exactly what you look like when you're finished. And he sees Jesus as we walk through this. I mean, it just doesn't get much better than this to me. And Isaiah says it this way. We are all the work of your hand. Amen. Does the creator really love me? Does he love you? Does he love you? <laughs> you, just you. If everybody else was gone out of here and you heard this, is it true? The sovereign creator of the universe loves you. And he created you as you. He made you. I don't, I don't know how he thought about it and all of that because he's God and I'm obviously not. But using terms I can relate to, he thought about it. And he said, I'm going to make me a Paul farmer. And I'm going to shape this guy. And I'm going to do the things to him that need to be done. And, I, and I'm going to do it. Right? Is, is that what happened? Am I making this up? No, it's, right. it's true for every one of us. Fill in your name. God did it. Right. God made you just the way you are. I'm his workmanship. I, I, I'm the work of his hand. Now, I'm not talking some egotistical thing where you walk around going, yeah, I'm, God made me and I'm cool. <laughs> God made me to, to accomplish things that he wants me to accomplish. Yeah. And he said, only you can do that. Whatever your name is, fill it in. Only you can do it. You were made for specific tasks, to do specific things for the King of kings and Lord of lords, to further the work of the kingdom. Do you believe that? Yes. Is this true or not? <laughs> Has the potter fashioned you? Does he have a plan for you? For you? I know what I get like. It's not happening. Where's God? Right? I'm 19 years old. Where in the world's God? My life is almost over. I'm 62. I'm going to die soon. Am I, have I done anything that I'm supposed to be doing? Somewhere in between. Do you guys struggle with this kind of stuff? Wondering if God really knows what he's doing? if he really is the one who does? Is God your father? <laughs> you got to start there. Jesus was very clear about it. 
you read it, it, it's not that difficult to understand. There's the kingdom of God, and then there's everything else. <laughs> there's a child of God, being born again to be a child of God, or you're somewhere else. And that somewhere else was the kingdom of the enemy, child of the devil. He used lots of different expressions for it. There's the kingdom, and then there's everything else. Where are you today? Is God your father, or is someone else your father? We start singing, you're a good, good father, and you love me. And I can't even, I start crying. I start choking up. God loves me just the way I am. He made me. I'm not blaming him for the faults and the sins in my life. I'm talking about the, the, the things that, that are unchangeable in my life. He made those. And, and I am his workmanship, yeah. and so are you. <laughs> this doesn't get any better than that. But you've got to start with, is God your father? And if he isn't, don't leave here today until you leave the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light. Yeah. Cry out to him. Has sin gained a place? Ephesians 4, 27, the, the word is place. It's, it's literally ground. It means territory. It means, ha have we become accustomed to sin? To where we've made room for it in our life? To where we've said, go ahead. The, the picture's been used of like a beachhead, and you're landing, and, and the enemy comes in, and he, and he gets a place on our beach, our spiritual beach. And he gets embedded there and we invite him in and then he brings in reinforcements and he starts launching out into other areas of our life. Is there a place where we have become accustomed to sin? Where we've just grown used to it? It's okay. I know this is wrong. I know the scripture clearly says it's wrong, but it's okay. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. You read the surveys that are put out by Christian polling organizations or whatever and you find stuff where, you know, 68% of Christians say it's okay to live in adultery. No, it isn't okay to live in adultery. No, it's not okay to be a homosexual. <gasps> no, it's not okay. It's sin. And so is lying and cheating and stealing. Those are sin. <laughs> and sin takes us somewhere. Have we grown accustomed to it? I know I'm in this relationship, and it's, we haven't done anything. We're just, we're just bonding. Really? Stop it. Just stop it. Walk away from it. Right. Quit arguing about how close you can get to the line and just turn around and walk away and go somewhere else. Why do we do that? And then we wonder what happens to us. Have we given the enemy an opportunity in our life? Let's stop it if we have. It's pretty straightforward. Do you believe, most of you in here are believers, and I know that, and I'm grateful for that, but do you believe that God's, you're God's handiwork? Not me, but you. Right where you sit, who you are, where you are, do you believe it? <laughs> and if not, why not? The Word of God's true. So is your understanding of the Scripture off? Is Ephesians 2.10 accurate? Am I misquoting it? Show me if I am. Are you fearfully and wonderfully made? Just the way you are. God messed up. No, he didn't. He's the master. God does not make mistakes, and you're not a mistake. I don't care what you were told as a child. Some of us grew up being told we were unloved, we were unwanted, we were a mistake. My father, who is God, has never said that to me. He said, I love you. I want you. I want you to be everything I have for you. He's a good, good father. Amen. Regardless of what you may have heard, the truth of God's word corrects that. <laughs> so do you believe you're God's handiwork, created for good works? You are. And the last question I'll ask is, do you believe you're being shaped by the potter? Some of you in here are being refined. Fun process, isn't it? Mold me, no. Make me, don't, just stop. I have a hard time singing those sometimes because I know what's involved with it. It's that guy getting his face smashed in that picture. And God's taking stuff and showing me my heart and showing me my sin and showing me where I've fallen short and showing me my attitudes and holding up a mirror and saying, do you really like this? This is ugly. No, I don't, Lord, help me. Okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to bring somebody in to show it to you. Most of the time our molding and making and shaping comes through relationships. Yippee. Right? 
A mirror gets held up when our flesh is shown or a demonstration of our rotten, stinking attitudes and so forth. Again, maybe I'm just talking to me. But it's almost always in relationships where those things come out. Where God says, it's time for you to take another spin on the wheel. Here's a little more water. Here's a little more moldy. I'm going to cut this off. And Some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. But whatever you're going through right now, I guarantee you that the master has his hand on it. <laughs> because he doesn't make mistakes. And he doesn't let go. <laughs> I don't know what happens to clay if the guy lets go. Does it just go flying off or something? But I know our potter has it all under control. <laughs> And he's spinning at just the right speed, and he's doing the things that he's doing, and he's shaping us into vessels for his usage. And he doesn't make mistakes. So whatever you're going through today, you can rest in that. You can trust that, as I can. You're a good, good father who loves me, and you're working in my life. I know it may be uncomfortable. It may be hard. God, I know you're working. You have an end result in mind when you started on me, and you're working, and I thank you for it. That's where we need to get to. So, God, I'm very grateful that you love us. (laughs) Lord, you could have set things up so many different ways, and yet you chose to do it this way, to where you would be our Father and that you would love us. The nations walk in the fear and dread of their God. You said you love us, (laughs) and you loved us so much you sent your Son to die for us, to do what we could not do to take away that sin that leads us to death and destruction. You didn't leave us dead in our sins and trespasses. You didn't leave us in the kingdom of darkness. You have brought us in the kingdom of light in your Son, and I'm so grateful for that. And God, I'm thankful that you promised to never leave us or forsake us. No matter how many times I fall, no matter how many times I fail, no matter how many times I fall short, you love me. You said, I'll never leave you. I never will forsake you. I will complete the work I began in you. (laughs) And I'm so grateful for that, Lord. That your word has shown us these things. And it's true. Lord, I pray that we would be people of your word. That we would not be overwhelmed with the things of this world. Lord, that we would be people who understand who you are through the word of God that you are the sovereign God of the universe who loves us. (laughs) Thank you so much for that. Thank you for another day that we've been able to gather together in your name. Lord, I pray that we would be changed a little bit more into your likeness. Thank you for it. Amen.